Hi, my name is Ben Cull and welcome to another Dev Superpowers. Today I'm going to be taking you through the ASP.NET identity system using the latest vNext technology, also known as ASP.NET 5 these days. Uh, and more specifically, we're going to be using Identity 3, which is the new stuff and it's still in beta. But what I'd like to take you through today is just the stuff that's not really going to change. This is going to be uh, fundamentally what's there, um, stuff that changed or is going to change because it's in beta. Um, I'll try not to touch on too much. Um, but to set expectations, today we are going to be going from file new project all the way through to a successful identity implementation. Uh, that includes things like checking out the new configuration stuff, um, showing you the identity code itself, um, looking at how the data database is uh, set up. Um, we'll touch briefly on the migrations, maybe just take a look and see how they're there by default now. Um, we will take a look at uh, getting Facebook authentication working. So we're going to log into our application using Facebook. We will implement the message service uh, and that lets us send emails uh, for email confirmation essentially if you want to confirm the user's email address and also SMS's for two-factor authentication which should be pretty cool. Uh, we'll also take a look at um, how dependency injection is in pretty much everything now. Uh, if you haven't used DI before, you're certainly going to with ASP.NET 5. Uh, it, it's really fundamental to the, um, to the framework now. Um, for those of you who have used the old identity stuff, we're also going to be taking a look at the authorize attribute. Um, and that includes looking at roles and how they work in the new system. It's very much the same. And finally, we're going to get onto claims-based authentication in the context of an MVC application. And so, yeah, if you haven't seen a Dev Superpowers before, this is pretty much it. It's going to be you, me, the computer, which is going to get stuck in and code. So, let's go do that. First thing is first, we're going to bring up a brand new Enterprise 2015 RC. RC1, I'm guessing, in case there are future release candidates. All right, so we're in web, file new project, we'll go web application, I'll call this test v next web uh, three, I guess I'm up to. All right, so, so far so good, pretty familiar. Um, you can see the old 4.6 templates at the top here. And what we're going to be using is the ASP.NET 5 preview templates just below. And if you take a look at change authentication, we're just using the default individual user accounts. And that's pretty much it. So let's fire that up. You'll see that it goes and spins up the project and starts adding the packages as it normally would, but we don't have to wait for that anymore. Um, we'll ignore the source control for now. And you might see down the bottom here, it'll say uh, package restore complete. There you go. And so that's gone and fetched all the packages. Now, one thing to note with ASP.NET 5 is there is so much that is different. Um, it's going to take a long time to, for everyone to wrap their heads around all the changes they've made to ASP.NET 5. There's just so many fundamental changes, the project structure, the actual configuration, where things go, all sorts of different technologies, um, especially since the adoption of things like Bower, Gulp and Grunt and all the sort of open source community technologies. Um, today, pretty much we're just going to look at the identity stuff. So a lot of this stuff I just won't touch because it's just too much to sort of take in at once. Um, a couple of things we will be looking at are things like dependency injection though. So first things first, I like to build, run, just to make sure everything's up and running, which it is. There we go. Beautiful. We see the new default page. Get to see a new one of these every .NET framework and every MVC change. Uh, but that's looking pretty good. So I guess the first thing to do is go and navigate through the app and we'll check out sort of where everything is. Probably the first thing to take a look at is the startups. Yes, this is where the magic starts. So similar to the previous MVC, MVC 5 version, we do have a startup class. This is called 
when the application pool spins up. Um, important things to see here are the fact that configuration files are now in JSON. Um, and this, these few lines of code basically suck in that JSON file, parse it, and then make it available to you as an I configuration. Moving slightly further down, we can see that it is going and setting up all the services. So this is where we add personally our services to the container as well. So uh, you'll see a lot of dependency injection stuff here. Configure services is given an interface and it'll go and fulfill that for you. So basically we can go and apply the app settings to a class and that's similar to, I'll just flick over to the config.json. Here's our app settings. And you'll see that the web config, which you know has been replaced by this config JSON, is much, much shorter. Pretty much we have an app settings section and a data section. Um, there's the new default connection string. Again, taking a look that this is the new local DB connection. Uh, which we'll connect to in a minute as well. But moving on, basically all the app settings get thrown into this class. So you notice that we just had a site title. So if we jump in here, you'll see site title. These are called, um, when you use services.configure, these are called options. And we'll take a look at that shortly as well. Um, Entity framework, again, in by default, you can see that we spin it up here, basically we're saying, hey, we're using Entity Framework, it'll use a SQL Server. We'll pass it the DB context, and the options for that DB context are go and grab the connection string from data, colon, default connection, colon, connection string, which maps directly to this, data, colon, default connection, connection string. Um, the most important one here, services.addIdentity, this is what lets MVC know, or rather the ON pipeline know that we are going to be using the identity framework. We'll give it the application user, which is our particular user class. I'll just jump in quickly and show you that. It's an empty class, inherits identity user, and we'll check that guy out in a sec. We also pass it identity role, which is the default role implementation as well. We tell it that we're going to be storing the user data, the identity data, in the application DB context that we spun up just before. And add default token providers. Basically, this just lets you, um, it implements the default things like setting up an email token and an SMS token and all the sorts of um, sort of authentication things we're going to make use of. Now you can see just further down that we've got uh, some options for adding our third party authentication systems such as Facebook and Microsoft. Uh, you can see that pretty much they've got a hard, like a POCO class there and the authentication keys come in from the configuration. We'll go add those in a second as well. You got services.addMVC, which of course just says, hey, use MVC. And if you're using Web API, uh, I believe it's built in, but you do not like it's built into the MVC one now. Uh, but this guy will let you gain access to some of the older web API code. Uh, moving slightly further down, you can see that there's another configure sort of method here. And I think potentially these methods are subject to change, but for now that's uh, what they look like. And basically this just sets up a few of our sort of application things. So we've got a logger that's built in now. Um, you can check what development, or rather what environment you're in and set up a few things. Um, I guess the important things here are the fact that we spin up identity, we say use identity, and we have our default routes. We'll come back and use this Facebook authentication one later in a minute as well. So it's a bit of a look at startup. It's pretty simple. Um, you'll see that authentication and all that sort of stuff is built in for us. Um, I think probably the best thing to do is go take a look at the database and how this whole thing works. So if we flick over back to our application, and we'll just register with a new user. Let's call it test36. You can see I do a fair bit of testing. Um, Mailinate is a handy little uh, application that lets you just plug in any, a real email address. It'll accept emails. You can go check it. So we've just signed up with test36. And now the best thing to do is go load up SQL Server and fire up the database and see what's happened. So you can see I've been testing this before there. But Entity Framework has spun up our new database. We can see the ASP.NET uh, tables have automatically been added and as well as the migration history because we're using Entity Framework's 
migrations. If we take a look at ASP.NET users in the correct database, we'll see our test 36 and all of the associated data there. Not very interesting at the moment, but you can see that it's all working straight out of the box. Test 36 and pretty much that's all there is there. What I might show you now is just how that database stuff got there. Um, you'll see by default in the new project there's a migrations folder. This is Entity Framework 7's code first migrations. The first migration called Create Identity Schema basically houses all of those tables we just saw in the database. Yeah, claims, logins, da 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 da. Now, if you understand how migrations work, you'll also notice that the uh, schema and the model are below. So, if it, uh, Entity Framework takes a snapshot of the model to determine what has changed. So, when you fire up this particular um, schema, it's just letting the database know that, hey, this is the model that I'm implementing, and you should understand from here there's no new changes. Um, and there's the application DB context model snapshot, which I believe evolves as you go. So the more migrations you add, the more that this will evolve over time. Um, but we won't go into that too much. Just understand that in our database classes, so we've got our user that I showed you just before, but in our actual database context, the only code here is in the constructor, check if it's been created statically, so this will run once per app pool, um, once per app pool spin up essentially, and you've got database as relational apply migrations. So as soon as the application context is spun up for the first time, it'll go and apply the migrations. So that's how basically when we hit run, this got spun up by DI, and then it applied the migrations to build those identity tables for us. So we're not gonna to be touching too much there, um, we won't even really be touching the application user themselves, though we'll be making use of it. Um, okay, so explaining this user stuff, basically the, the differences here, or rather the stuff in the identity three, and even two, I think, is this identity DB context. So most people who have used code first, um, or even entity framework six before, uh, have seen that you usually inherit from DB context. And all the identity system does now is give you a new class to inherit from called identity DB context. And all we do is pass it the type of user that we're going to use. And that has to inherit from identity user. Now, a bit of a caveat here is that the primary key of an application user or the primary key of an identity user is a GUID. Um, you can change it to an int, but I wouldn't mess around with that at the moment because uh, the API structure is in flux and it's probably a lot more work than it's worth at the moment. Though I think they're building, the Entity Framework guys that is, and the Identity guys, I think they're building uh, better compatibility for an integer-based primary key. But what we will do instead is probably let's go set up the Facebook uh, integration. That's probably a nice way to start. So we've already taken a look at just registering a normal user. Let's go check out what we need to get Facebook working. So if you head over to startup, you can see that there's actually links here that will tell you, you know, hey, go uh, add this particular authentication. But what we'll do is we'll start from the beginning. So we need to configure the service for the Facebook authentication options. So all we do is we need to fulfill this particular configuration now, I've already, I'm not going to go through showing you how to set up a Facebook developer account. Um, I'm going to get you to go and do that yourself separately. Um, but all you need to know is once you've gone to developers.facebook.com, I think it is, created a new application, you'll be given an app ID and an app secret. And all we'll do is put that into our config.json. And we'll follow that same pattern. So authentication, Facebook, app ID. So just anywhere up in here, we'll go authentication is a new object. And then we want Facebook, another new object. Essentially, we want app ID, and that'll be equal to a string. And we also want app secret. 
that will be equal to another string. Now I'm just going to flick over to my previous uh, project and grab those two values. There we go. Let's just clean up the formatting there. Okie doke. So we've got the particular values in place. What we need to do now is go and set up our uh, startup. Values are in place. We just need to go down and say, hey, use Facebook authentication as well. Really, it's just super simple. We'll rebuild and then we'll go check out that result. So we'll hit refresh here. We'll also just log off so we're not using test 36 anymore. And this time you'll notice that if you go to register, I always make this mistake, you don't see anything for Facebook and that's because technically you're not registering, you're logging in. And once you've added the Facebook, um, once you've uncommented that use Facebook authentication line in the startup CS, we have access to this guy here. So we're going to click, uh, let's sign up with Facebook. And of course I've previously done that before. So it's gone and just successfully authenticated. So I'll just quickly put in another email, test37 mailinnader.com and register there. And so basically now, if you take a look at test37, you can see I've got Facebook as a registered login. Um, I can't do anything with that login because it's the primary um, way of authenticating me for this account. There's no password, there's no other logins, therefore I can't delete the Facebook one. But what I might do is just quickly show you what the Facebook authentication looks like when you haven't already authenticated. So I'll just create a new incognito tab, go to the same website, we'll hit log in again, we'll say use Facebook, it flicks you over to Facebook, I'm going to go ahead and log in using my credentials. Once I've logged in, it will prompt you to authorize that particular application and bring you back here. Now, you can see that it's gone and skipped that authorization step because I've already authorized the application. You'll notice that it's logged in with test37 at Mailinator because I've already supplied the email address in that last step. And uh, pretty much from there, it's going to recognize me. Now, what you can also do is go and create a password. So if I say, I actually want to back up. I don't want only Facebook be, to be the only way into my application. I can go and put in a password, which I'm using super secure password one with a capital P and an at symbol. And there we go. Your password has been set. So now if I go and look at external logins, I can remove Facebook if I want to because it's no longer the primary way of accessing my account. Now you might notice this a couple of cool things here, phone number and two-factor authentication. Again, Microsoft handily gives you the links to go and set these things up. What I'll do is that set that up with you right now. So the first thing we'll do is jump back into the code, register, or rather account controller, and go past login all the way down to register. So what you can see here is more information, visit this link and that'll take you directly to that page I was just on. Now, what this does is when you uncomment this, it sends an email with the link. So generate email confirmation token async. Again, that uses the um, default tokens that were created in our startup. So uh, add default token providers in here. Uh, this makes use of that and generates an email token. Now you might see this thing called user manager and wonder what that is. Well, we'll just scroll up to the top and show you that the account controller, when it's spun up, has two dependencies injected here. It has a user manager based on type application user and a sign-in manager based on type application user. Now these are probably the two main um, helper, I guess, classes you're gonna be using when dealing with users and signing in and all this account controller stuff. Now, those are implemented for you. That's part of the identity system, though you can override them. And we might take a quick look at that uh, later on to add a, a bit of functionality uh, on top of the default stuff. So with users, you might add some extra validation around when a user can be created. 
um, and the sign-in manager, you'll see a bunch of stuff we'll edit with the claims authentication. But for now, let's go down here, back to our email confirmation. So just walking through this quickly, it's gonna generate a code for us. It, we're gonna put that code into an email, um, into a callback URL as, well, URL as well. We're gonna make use of the message services to send an email asynchronously. And then after that, you, the documentation gets you to comment this line out so that you're forced to go back to your email address click the link and then it will log you in. Whereas I prefer mainly from a user sort of experience point of view to send the email just to get confirmation, but also leave this line in so that they can log in straight away pretty much and use the system. And then if you've got anything where you really don't want them using the system until they're confirmed, you know, you can check the user column or the user um, class for the email confirmed column and you can basically change your logic based on that. So I'm gonna leave all that the way it is. And I'm gonna jump over to the message services and you'll see that at the moment, sending emails and sending SMSs aren't implemented. So what I'd like to do is show you a quick way of implementing uh, send email. Uh, personally, I like a service called Mandrill. I believe the documentation likes a service called SendGrid. I like Mandrill because it's by the MailChimp guys and it's just a really nice API and all that sort of stuff. Um, you'll also note, I might even just do it really quickly. One of my favorite um, NuGet packages, and I'm just adding a NuGet package now, it's called Fluent Email. Just let that guy load up. So Fluent Email by Luke Larry. This is one of the best uh, implementations of an email sender I've seen. Uh, pretty much what we'll do is install that. And go, yep. Package restore in progress, very good. While that's ticking along, I'm just gonna go grab my SMTP settings from the previous project as well. You'll see here SMTP. Now one of the pains, I'm not sure if you used SMTP in previous projects, but in the web config, you used to be able to just set it in the SMTP config area, and then the system would pick up on it automatically. Go and close that now. Whereas I currently haven't figured out a way for the system to do it automatically. I have left it in the config like so. So I've, this is just a custom amount of config. Um, I'm saying SMTP, here's the host and the port for the SMTP server, username and password, and don't worry, password will be changed. Um, actually, this is one good point. The, uh, the documentation for adding identity and all this sort of stuff suggests that you do not put your app secrets and your keys and passwords and stuff in the config.json. And the reason they do that is because people have been pushing their source code to public repositories on GitHub, etc., and basically exposing all their keys. Now, one obvious thing to do here is just use a private repository. Um, you can pay for it on GitHub, it's pretty cheap. Um, I do that. And you're not gonna have this problem. Alternatively, you can use a thing called the secrets manager. Now I've had a bit of a look into it and all it does is basically hide this JavaScript configuration and put it in a, a folder deep in your, basically your personal profile, your user profile. Um, and it'll go and fetch that stuff locally from the machine each time. Now, if you deploy your application to Azure, it automatically plugs in the values using the environment variables. So that's actually a pretty nice way of doing it, but locally I prefer to just not expose my source code. It's just much more simple to leave it here. Um, okay, so first things first, we're gonna jump into startup and we're gonna get this SMTP um, configuration into a, a POCO. So what we'll do is we'll quickly create a new folder called, let's call it helpers for now. I'm just gonna put various classes in here. So I'm gonna call this guy SMTP settings, regular old class, and pretty much in here, I'm just gonna put in the uh, POCO equivalent of the settings in our configuration file. So we've got string host, we've got the port, we've got the username, and we've got the password. Now, another thing I'm gonna do just quickly, and I might just copy this one for the sake of time, 
is grab a new SMTP client. And what this will do for us is basically use the data in this settings instance and jump out an SMTP client for us. Um, yeah, pretty straightforward that stuff there, host port, username, password. So in our messages service, which I'm actually going to break and change it into a non-static class because at the moment, the dependency injection stuff from ASP.NET 5 mainly works with constructor um, dependencies only. So what I'm doing here is adding a dependency for our SMTP settings class so that in the constructor, we request an SMTP settings class It'll go fetch one from the dependency injection service and plonk it into our private variable here. And what this lets me do is say, hey, uh, grab the SMTP server and send that email. So we'll go SMTP, oops, dot get SMTP client. And then we'll say, okie dokie, client. Um, it's equal to new fluent email. Email. So again, this is the fluent email uh, class. We're going to spin up a new email given the client. So we'll put the client in there. And the reason I like this so much is now you've got a fluent API for the rest of your data. So we've got new fluent email dot email, and then you just go dot. I'm going to say this is from, or rather up here, I guess we'll say it's from. There it is. So we'll say it's from, and I'll just put my account. I'll say it's Ben Cole. And it's to the email address supplied to us. The subject. Not happy. What's up? Email address, email. Nope. Let's try not assigning this for now. There we go. The subject is subject. The body, in this case, we're going to add um, just the body regularly and we'll call that message. So we've got an email given an SMTP client from me to that email, given a subject and a message, and then we'll go and send that guy. Uh, we can send that async as well. Oh, actually we won't send that async, we'll just send it normally for now. And that's pretty much it there. So the task from result is when you don't have an async task to return, so you can just go from result zero and it will finish up. But uh, let's go see if that worked. Oh, of course it didn't because what we need to do is hook up the SMTP settings in the dependency injection. So to recap with this SMTP settings stuff, what I've done is get the config.json and put in some SMTP settings. I've then gone and created a regular POCO class to, uh, with just some settings and a little helper method to go and get me an SMTP client. But I haven't told ASP.NET or rather MVC to go and put the config uh, data into this settings class. And I do that in the startup section. Um, and it's very similar, so you can copy it from the app settings way of doing things. So basically we go services.configure. We say SMTP settings. And then we say configuration dot get sub key and then we put in SMTP and that's equal to the root of the class of the uh, settings that we're adding so there's the root and there's all the properties that will be applied and of course because I went and changed the messages service from a static class to a non-static class we need to go quickly fix all that up so first things first I'm going to add some dependencies for our new class, which is the message service. This is class. Now I'm using ReSharpie here to make this quick, but of course you have 
the private read-only prop oh, variable, I guess. Uh, and that's private and read-only because it's only available to this class and it's injected through the constructor and set in the constructor so it can be read-only. So now when we go down to our message service, we can put in little lowercase messages service and we'll do that for the other errors as well. Now I think it's complaining on me as well because um, it needs to build to go and grab the NuGet packages and I don't think it's gone and grabbed fluent email yet. Uh, message service, message service. And there we go. So that's lowercase as well. I think there could be a couple more. Maybe not, let's have a build. Yes, there are. Again, the message service is the thing in charge of sending emails and SMSs. And I've just got uh, mail not existing. Ah, yes, here's an excellent point. So the new ASP.NET 5, um, I guess, uh, way of doing things is you can, you can target certain uh, frameworks now. It's no longer just right-click properties and then you're always targeting .NET 4 or you know a, a project used to only be able to target one framework. Now this is really important because it's, it's not very obvious and you can see here it's just I'm, it looks like I'm missing assembly references when I'm not. But the thing to note from this is if you look at the project it's test vnextweb3.dnx core 5. So the project here is referencing DNX core five. Now, if we jump into, I believe it's our references, you can see two libraries in here. Now, normally you'd see a whole bunch of DLLs, but they're actually tucked away inside these two libraries. And these are actually frameworks. So we've got DNX 451, which is the full .NET framework and the next generation, so vNext. And we have DNX core five, which is actually a slimmed down version of the .NET framework. It's the true next generation framework and this is the one that'll let you run on Linux and you know Raspberry Pi and all that sort of stuff. But unfortunately it's missing a whole bunch because it's slimmed down, missing a whole bunch of um, dependencies including system.net.mail um, and so when you're building uh, applications probably to start with especially while there's not many NuGet packages uh, available or targeting core five, you're probably going to have to remove this reference. And the way you do that is check out the project JSON. So in here, again, this is the equivalent of a project file now. Um, it's all JSON configuration. You can see our dependencies or our new get packages. There's fluent email at the bottom. Sorry, just there. Um, you've got a few bits at the top here, which is our own application settings. Uh, and if you take a look here, you've got frameworks. DNX451 and DNX core. What we'll do is just delete DNX core, hit save, hit build, and all of a sudden our build is succeeding. So that's a bit of a tricky error that you might come across when developing, and I'm glad I came across it on video as well. Um, okay, so now, just quickly to recap, we've added our settings to config JSON. We've gone to startup and mapped those settings to a POCO using direct dependency injection. We then make use of those settings in here in the uh, SMTP settings, get SMTP client area. And, uh, oh, actually one thing to note, and this is probably pretty important as well. The, this shouldn't work. Let's run it and see that it doesn't work. And then I'll explain why it doesn't work. So if we log off, uh, there we go. An unhandled exception occurred, unable to resolve type for message services. And this is, oh, by the way, this is the new, you know, uh, error sort of exception stack. And you've got a whole bunch of cool sort of 
bits in here now, but the thing to take away from this is unable to resolve service for type, which means it's a dependency injection error. Uh, message services is the class that it couldn't do it. And it was while it was a trying to activate the account controller. So it went account controller, which had a dependency on message services, and something in message services went wrong. And you'll see, uh, I don't know if it's gonna tell us in here, uh, get service, no, it's probably not. What the problem is, if we jump back into our code here, here's message services. We only have one dependency, so we know straight away what the problem is, and that's our SMTP settings. Now, one critical mistake I've made here is in the startup section. This is not just a regular class uh, that we're using here. Configure isn't a way to just set a dependency. We'll, we'll show you that in a minute, but it's actually setting an options. And you can see that down here with the Facebook one, services.configure, Facebook authentication options. It's a special type of class called an options class, essentially. And I'm not too sure you know, what the ins and outs of them are at the moment. But what I do know is that when you're um, setting your dependencies, you actually want an I options of type POCO. So we'll go and let that import what it needs to import. And again here, I options of SMTP settings. And that changes this a little bit because what it means is now in our class, we have an options property. And in there, we have the same options as before. So there's our four properties in our method. We'll hit save and build. And this time, it should work. We shouldn't get that uh, dependency error. So again, we'll log off. Oh, no, didn't like that. Didn't like that at all. Let's just quickly look at our old solution. So we have our SMTP settings as per normal. Um, and looking at the message service, I options, SMTP settings. Yeah, that's all it needed. Let's have a bit of a rebuild. No, it really doesn't like this one. Account controller, let's just make sure there's nothing in there. Oh, it doesn't know what the message services class is. Of course. So in the account controller where we inject a message services, it doesn't quite know what that is. And I'm guessing that's because we haven't gone and told it yet. So back to DI, services, dot. And this time what we want to do is add, and we'll make this one scoped. And that's a message services. So what this is doing is it's saying um, add scoped, which uh, in dependency injection land, you've got basically three life cycles. You've got transient, which means that every time you request the dependency, it'll spin up a new one. You've got scoped, which means that every time you request a dependency, it'll give you a new one per request. Um, and that's per HTTP request or thread. So essentially, if I ask for a DB context, no matter how many times I ask for it in the one request, it'll give me that same one. Um, and finally, we have add singleton, which will give me one instance of that object over the entire lifecycle of the application. Um, so the messages services one will add as scoped. And this time, there we go. Now we're happy. So to recap what we're looking for when we set up a new account, and this time we'll go over to test 37, is it should log me in, but it should also send an email to this email address, letting me know how to, um, oh, I've already used that one. Letting me know how to, uh, oops. Uh, letting me know to confirm my email address. So test 38 at Mailinator, just go over to Mailinator, hit up test 38. And here we are, from Ben Cull, confirm your account. So we can click into that. Now you'll notice we're still logged in, here's test 38. Um, but if we jump over to the database and we select everything from users, there's test 38. And you can see this email confirmed column is equal to zero. But as soon as we come in here and it says, please confirm your account by clicking this link, click, 
There you go, confirmed email. Thank you for confirming your email. Click here to log in. You'd probably update that view because you're already logged in. But uh, now if we jump over to that database and run that same query, email confirmed is one. So that's just a nice little built-in uh, way to confirm your email address. Uh, we will close that guy down for now and close that one down as well. And I guess probably the next coolest thing to see would be two-factor authentication and you know taking it one step further and not just you know confirming their email address but also getting them to you know input their phone number and um, supply codes that way. And again, so far I haven't written anything custom. All I've done is pretty much use the built-in stuff. So I'm going to log out and we're going to start tackling two-factor authentication. Now, we've already been given a clue over in the manage um, controller and the manage view that there's some stuff to let you um, add two-factor authentication by yourself or that use the built-in stuff. So if I go to, what was it, manage um, index and you can see here we are. So there's some stuff in the phone number section and in stuff in here as well that we can comment out or rather uncomment. So we'll do those. Save that guy. Back to the manage controller and we'll just skip through to see where we can find that stuff as well. So we've got some add phone number methods here and again they're just already built in and I think the rest of it is all good to go. Yep, that's looking good. So pretty much it's just uncommenting a couple of stuff in the view. Um, and of course, the other thing we need to do is go back to our message service and implement the second half of this, send SMS async. Now to save time, uh, I'm gonna get you to just go follow the instructions in the uh, documentation that they provide. But what I've done previously as well is implement Twilio. Now this is the same stuff they provide in their instructions. Um, I'll plug that guy in and of course you're going to need the Twilio NuGet package so I'll go grab that as well Twilio REST helper library is the one we need alright brilliant um, Okie doke. So we have our Twilio NuGet package installed. You can see here I've used Twilio settings, which again, if you had a look at SMTP settings, it's probably going to be a similar deal. So I'll go and grab that one from the old project Twilio settings. Again, take a look. It's just an SID, an auth token, and a phone number, and then a Twilio REST client. So we'll go and copy that code over, jump into helpers, create a new class called Twilio settings. Paste in our code, reference the NuGet package there using Twilio. Um, pretty simple stuff there. And of course, as you may have guessed, we now need to go get our configuration, which will be put into that particular uh, Poco. So I've just used Twilio at the bottom here. And bang, so Twilio account. Check out Twilio, by the way, if you haven't used it before. It's very cool, pretty simple to get set up. Um, you'll have an ID, an authentication, and this is the phone number. Now, one thing that tripped me up is that not all phone numbers around the world um, support SMS. And so you may need to get a US number like I have here for SMS to work. But now we have a config, we have a class. Next thing to do, same again as this one, is connect that configuration into that class. So the Twilio settings class using configuration get sub key and we named it Twilio. Okay, so that's gonna give us our settings class now in our messages service, we want to do the same again pretty much. So we'll options it up with Twilio settings. 
name it Twilio settings, inject that guy. Again, all it does is put in an I options into the constructor and set it to the private variable. And then you'll see that Twilio settings dot options because it's that special options class, get Twilio client that we built. And then we send an SMS, pretty much just sending a message using the from number from our configuration the two number which is given to us and the message which is given to us. Then we return from result zero because we're done. So I'm gonna give that a build and just quickly recap. Again, all we've done is implement the message service for SMSs using Twilio. And the other thing we've done is uncomment a couple of commented pieces of code in the manage slash index.cshtml. Once that's built, We'll head back over to our home page. And this time, when we, let's log in with Facebook so we can pick up one of those users we had. There we go, test 37. Now when we come into here, we suddenly have a couple of options available to us. Now you can pretty much just delete these two explanation pieces, but you'll see that we have phone numbers add and two-factor authentication enable. So the first thing I'm gonna do is put in my phone number and get this ready because when I click send verification code, ding, ding, there it is. I'll just open up my phone and you can see there, hopefully at the bottom that we've been given a code. If that particular piece of video didn't work, my code is 521171, came through in the message, I'll hit submit and then bang, your phone number was added. And so from now on, I can say, hey, two-factor authenticate. And now when I log in, it's gonna ask, it's gonna send me a message. And I'll give you a bit of an example. So if I log off and then log back in, and this is actually an excellent test because I'm not sure if it does it for Facebook or third-party authenticated uh, accounts. So let's try it. Oh, yep, it does. So it's gone and done the Facebook authentication fine. Sends you to the send verification code or the two-factor auth. Now we can pick phone because that's the only thing we have available. Again, we haven't implemented an email or rather we haven't added an email address. So we hit submit. Bling blong, new message. 759120. And you've given the option to remember the browser. Now that just means, similar to other services you may have used, that uh, it's gonna set a cookie and it's gonna remember this machine and this browser and not ask for two-factor authentication again. But that's pretty cool. I mean, we didn't have to implement much and we've gotten two-factor authentication. Pretty happy with that. Uh, I guess the next thing to, to show you quickly before we wrap up are the roles and the claims. So. Let's jump straight back in, we'll close down all of these. Now, if you've used roles uh, before, this probably isn't gonna to be too much different, but uh, the, the different pieces of the interface you have to the roles. So, for testing purposes, I'm gonna go ahead and spin up a new controller. I'm just gonna call this guy user controller. And in here, instead of an index, I'm gonna start adding the various bits I need. So one common thing you're gonna need is an administrator account. So if I go ahead and add a task of I action result, you might notice now that there's an interface for the action result. I'm gonna say create admin. And all of this is just gonna be example. You'd normally add this create admin to perhaps a seed of the database. Um, but moving along, let's add the new user. So basically what we wanna do is create an application user, which is the built-in user type. And it keeps completing braces for me, which is not fun. Uh, what have I done? Can I mark up my braces? Oh, yes, of course. So var user equals new application user. Oh, the braces. 
So what we're given is a few, a few bits and pieces, but what I'm going to set here uh, is an email address. I'll set it to my main one. Um, looking through here, we don't really need to add too much to it. We do need to add a username. It's not going to like one without it. And that, you know, to be honest, is pretty much all you need. Um, just double check that we're not missing anything, but I'm pretty sure that's all you need. Let's take a quick look at our user controller, hey? Email confirmed, true. I guess you could put that in because you, know you know it's true. Why not? Let's do that. Not needed, but why not? So the next thing we're gonna need is our user manager. So much like our other dependency injection, we're going to ask for a user manager. This is the way we manage users using identity. You can see here, asp.net.identity. Given a T user, which in our case is the application user, the built-in default. And I'll call this guy user manager. I will inject that guy in. And just below here, you can see that if we use the user manager, we have, well, actually, to take a quick look at these methods, we have adding claims, adding passwords, adding logins, changing things, creating, deleting, finding, generating. There is so much here to look through, but it's all pretty, you know, straightforward. I haven't found anything in here quite out of the ordinary. Now, because this is a user manager, we are going to create a new user. We'll pass in that guy. And because we're manually creating this particular admin, I'm going to provide the password right here using our super secure password one. And we are an async await method, so we go public async, always return a task, and we can await that particular user being created. And to show you that, and for a lot of this stuff, I'll just return JSON. And if you've used this before, you'll notice that there's no longer the allow get that used to go here. You can just put it straight in and it works, which is a godsend for me, I think. I was always forgetting to do that. So creating a user. There's the new application user, user management, and we give it a manual password and then we spit that out. So let's oops, jump over to our page. We have the user controller called create admin. Let's see what that gives us back. There we go, succeeded true. We can go over to our users column and we'll see there he is. And his email is confirmed. And that is very good. But really all we've done is create a user and it's just a regular user, it's not an admin. So to prove that, let's jump back into the code. And we'll create another controller, new item, MVC controller, and we'll call this one the admin controller. And we'll put a new view in, why not? Let's just say default view. Everything's the same, don't need a layout. We'll call this admin, and I'll just put, hey, this part is secret. So there we go, we have an index. And to lock it down, using roles, we use the authorize uh, attribute. Here it is here. Now you'll notice in here, we can also pass it roles. So there's a couple of levels here. Authorize by itself just means you need to be a logged in user. It doesn't matter. There's no restrictions on roles or users. We can add to the roles and say, hey, admin, you've got to be an admin to access the admin controller. And there's other things in here such as um, I think users and other, and other bits and pieces. You can see that uh, up the top there, policies, etc. But for now, we're going to use authorized roles admin. And we're going to go and try and hit this particular controller using our new admin that we've just created, even though he's not really an admin. And you'll see that when we try to do that, despite already being logged in, we're sent to the login page. Now, if you have a quick look at my gist, 
you'll see I've got, uh, let's go to all my gists. You'll see I've got one called, uh, oh, he's not here. Oh, maybe it's in older. Basically, I've got a class that goes and redirects you to the correct place rather than, um, yeah, no. Let's try Ben, Cole, and uh, login redirect. Yeah, here we go. This is the class on Stack Overflow, Ben, Cole, redirect. And pretty much what it does is it goes and redirects you to an unauthorized page rather than just spitting you back to the login page, which is a bit confusing for people who are already logged in. But what it does do is prove a point that um, we're not authorized to access that page. So what we need to do now is create a role and assign our user to that role. So if you may have guessed, we'll, we'll just jump into the uh, user controller for this one. And I'm going to say public async task. I action result. We're going to A, create a role. And this one will take the name of the role. And we're going to need a new manager. Now, this is another manager you're probably going to be using a fair bit. And it's called the role manager, funnily enough. Now it takes a T role. Now much like our application user class, we need to use the built-in role class now. It's called identity role. And you can remember that because way back over here in startup, uh, right up the top where we configured our add identity, we passed it the user we're gonna use and the role. And so this is it here, identity role in the identity framework. So we say role manager, add that guy to the dependency injection list as well. And we'll create that new role. So we'll get role is equal to new identity role. Identity role. We can just give it the name here. So I'll pass in role name. And using the role manager, we'll create async as well. Now normally you'd take care to um, Make sure you don't add the roles twice and you know validate to see if it's already there, etc. But for now, for brevity, I'm just showing you the, the key ways of getting things done. And there we go. So we've added the role name to identity role. We've added the role to the create async in the role manager. Let's have a quick look at what that looks like. So create role in the user controller. So user controller. Create role and role name is equal to, I'm gonna say admin. And of course you'd lock these sorts of things down if, if you're using it as well. Um, so there we go, we've added that new role. It will exist and in fact, we can probably come in here and see if it is. So we'll go ASP net roles. And there it is. Name admin, normalize name admin, and its IDs. So, of course, you guessed it. The next thing to do is go and link that role to, so I'll say assign role to a user, and we'll take the username. This will be a good mixture of the different services, and we'll take the role name as well. Okie dokie. So, First things first, we want to go and grab the user. So we say, hey, user manager, go and find me a user by name. Now I'm using the username one. You can also use email, but this is my preferred way. Um, and in fact, in our application and by default, the username is the email address. So it doesn't make a difference. So we've got the user now. And what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, hey, user manager, please assign or add um, this particular user to a role. So add to role async, pass in the user we just fetched, and we pass in the name of the role, which in this case is role name. I'm gonna go grab the result of that guy for you and throw him into the JSON return, JSON result, 
There we go. Oh, yep, so that was strange. Again, something I forget to do is put the await keywords in. So we're awaiting on that user and grabbing it back here. We then have that application user and we pass it into the add to role async. Again, you're gonna to need to check for duplicates. Don't add the role to the user twice, etc., etc. But in the user controller, assign role and the username is bjcolorgmail.com. The role name is admin. And succeeded true, beautiful. So we could go check that out in the database, but I think a cooler way of checking that out is to jump into the page. Again, test 37, that's us, that's our admin. Um, oh, no, it's not, no, it's not at all. We want to log in with bjcarl at gmail.com using the password I provided. Hit log in, that's better. Now, if we jump over to admin, hey, this passes secret. Excellent, we've managed to go and assign a role to a user, lock down a controller and um, basically make use of roles. And then really quickly, probably one of the cooler things as well is using claim based authentication to just add another level of granularity to our um, authentication system. So, uh, I guess for those of you who haven't heard of claims, it's pretty much just a fact, you could think of it as a fact um, a lot of client-side applications use claim-based authentication to keep track of what bits and pieces you have access to uh, because all of the, um, I guess, you could kind of think of them as roles or little sub-roles, um, pieces of functionality that the user has access to are stored in the uh, token itself or the cookie or however that token is passed around. Um, and so what that means is you're not looking up the, you know, not hitting the DB every time and you can hand that token to a client-side application in AngularJS or something similar. And it's gonna be able to show and hide various bits and pieces uh, based on the information within that um, cookie and or token. But again, it's important to, in client-side applications, actually lock down the server-side endpoints um, and double check that that user does have access to those things. So keeping that token on the server and reading it there is good as well. So let's go add a couple of claims. Um, there's two ways of doing it. The first one, of course, is similar to a role and that you can add it to the database. So we will go in here, whack open a new action result, and we'll call this one create claim. And this one has a claim type and a claim value. Brackets got me again. Uh, and if you have a look at this, basically we say claim is equal to a new claim here in system security claims. Um, and in here I can say, oh, I'll give it the claim type and the claim value. Let's just see if we can get IntelliSense up there to show us what's going on. Claim is equal to claim, what have I done here? Oh, new claim, there you go. New claim. So given a type and a value, you can add other, other data as well, but that's the main one. Um, we use the user manager again for claims. So if you have a look here, you can see when you type add, we've just previously used add to role, but you can also say add claim. And this is going to, once we grab the user, so Grab that code from just up there as well. Request the username. And we will go ahead and add that claim to that user. Claim. We'll await it and we'll grab the result. And before we run that, although I guess we could do that now. So we'll say JSON result. So we grab the user, we create a claim, we add the claim, can't be more difficult than that. And again, this is usually just a piece of either it's a fact like, you know, country Australia or something like that. Uh, and it's just a convenient way of accessing that data or it's um, sort of sub roles. So 
an admin might have access to offer discount, um, change usernames, you know, all these sorts of claims you can create um, that give you a more granular focus or a more granular control over uh, particular um, features of your website. So we can create the claim and we might do that now. So user slash create claim. User create claim. And we give it the username we want. Again, you could access that off the system rather than through this uh, query string, but I'm just doing this for brevity. We have the claim type and I'm gonna call this uh, test claim. Name and value is going to be, I'll just say one. Uh, let's add that and see what happens. Okay, beautiful. Uh, probably the next thing to show you, it's all well and good to see a little succeeded message, but how do we see these claims? How do we get them? So another action result, I'll call this one get claims for a username. And what we'll do again is grab the user. And, oh, actually, no, we won't. So this is a better way of showing you. Um, what I'm gonna show you is the built-in user. Now, this is an MVC user, of course. You can see here that it's under the controller. And this gives us access to the claims principle, or essentially the logged in user. So up here, instead of using username, we could in fact use user and then identity and you know use their name from here instead and all that sort of stuff. But what this does let us do is say, hey, uh, get me all of the user's claims. Now I'm going to add this, or rather I'm going to use select to go and create a new object to show you this because there's a circular reference here if I do it otherwise. And so I'm gonna give you the type and value of the claim. Um, so there's our claims and then I'm going to return JSON claims. So this just shows you that you don't need to use your user manager to access this stuff. So the authorize attribute and all that sort of stuff makes use of the logged in user um, via the uh, built in MVC sort of user stuff. So we can get the user's claims and identity and other stuff from here, but get claims. Uh, we're not gonna need the username because we're using the logged in user and we're returning JSON. And it doesn't need to be async, but we will make it anyway. So. Uh, user get claims and what you'll see here and this is very interesting is that we have four built-in claims but not the claim we just put in ourselves now we did we had a success equals true just before and what you'll note is that claims are assigned to the user or the principal on login and they're designed to be built into the token. So we've already, we're already logged in, we already have our token, so the claims have already been set. Um, what we need to do essentially is go and add that claim in to our, or we just need to log in and out and we should get that new claim. So just showing you these default claims, you can see here that uh, there's a name identifier, I believe that's our GUID uh, for my user. Um, you've got the email address and or username. Uh, a security stamp and then you can also see here that roles themselves are also added as claims so you can make use of that information as well but what we'll do is we'll go and log off then we'll log back in I'll hit nope and then we'll go back to user get claims and there you go there you have a test claim so that's gonna hang around. Um, and that's you know kind of useful, but you might be thinking, oh, you know, that's not that really you know, much better than roles. I mean, I've got more granularity, yes, but I still need to add it to the database and manually add it as a claim and all that sort of stuff. Well, there's actually one cool thing you can do instead, and that's add claims uh, on the fly based on information gleaned from your system. So I'm just gonna go and grab the code for this one because we're just about over time. And essentially I've added it as a helper here. Um, where did I put that? I added it 
as an application sign-in manager. I'll walk you through this code though. Oops, number three. So I'm just gonna add this as a helper. It's a regular class and I'm gonna call application sign-in manager. Now for those who have keen eyes, you may notice that we've used sign-in manager already. Back here in the account controller, when you go ahead and log in, you're using a sign-in manager. And this one says password sign-in, da 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 and you've got other ones here. Um, but basically it handles, here you go, sign-in async, basically handles all this sign-in logic. Now this is very similar to user manager and roles manager because it's you know one of the built-in identity classes. But what you can do to extend the claims is inherit from that sign-in manager. Now you'll see that the sign-in manager has a few dependencies that you then need to request and then pass off to the base class. Um, I'll post this code uh, online afterwards as well so you can go in and poke around. But the key thing to look at here in the sign-in manager is that there's a create user principal async uh, method. And if you override that, you'll see it returns a claims principal given a user. Um, if you override it, what you can do is basically grab the base principal that it goes and creates by itself anyway. Um, inside that principal, we have a number of identities. So if we take the primary identity, which it says here is the primary claims identity, and we'll cast that to claims identity. What we can do is then add new claims on the fly to this particular identity based on our system. So in here I can have any dependencies and then when they log in, these claims will be added on the fly and they're not added to the database. These are just added to the token. So if you have some temporary things such as, um, um, actually one of the best examples I can think of is taking a look at the user itself um, and let's say we get uh, the date that they were added, if we can get that. Probably, oh, I'm sure it would have been in here. No, we'll, we'll use a different example. What I was gonna say is if you can get it the date they were added and you can check if it's less than say 30 days old, so they're less than 30 days old, you could add a claim that says they're a new user. Uh, so we'll say, I don't know, if phone number dot exists or something like that. Uh, what are you, a string? Yep. So if they have a, a phone number uh, dot is not empty. So we could add something saying, you know, um, phone accessible. And then we can say one for yes. Well, that's not how you spell accessible. Access. Able, accessible, accessible, able, okay. Um, there we go, add claim. And so, oh, we're using some funky C Sharp 6 uh, syntax here as well, identity. If identity is not null, go ahead and add the claim. That's a cool little trick there. Um, but yeah, so something like this is really cool. So basically if they have a phone number, though I will use something that I know we do have, which is an email, and I'll make it email accessible. From now on in, when the user logs in, if they have an email address, it'll add this claim on the fly and it's not in the database, which is really cool. So you can go in here and add new ones all the time. Uh, there's just one quick way to hook this up. You can't just create the class. You've just got to go into startup and just below your services.identity, uh, we're gonna add a new scoped service, so add scoped. And we're gonna say whenever the system requests a sign-in manager, of type application user. Whenever the system asks for one of those, what I want you to do is go and give it an application sign-in manager instead. And build. So those of you familiar with dependency injection will know this pattern quite well. Pretty much a scope depend dependency. When the system asks for a sign-in manager, give it an application sign-in manager instead. So let's just go check that out in action just briefly. So over to the browser. Now, of course, if we do this, it shouldn't be there because we need to log in again. 
So we'll go do that. Log off, log in. And finally, get claims, email accessible. And that is how cool the identity system is. There's just so much built-in richness that you can uh, gain access to. Um, but what I'll do is I'll leave it there. We've run a bit over time, but I hope you've enjoyed this identity talk. Um, stay tuned for future Dev Superpowers. Where I'll probably go in and take a look at how you can implement the JSON web tokens and you know connect this sort of system uh, to a client-side application. Um, but for now, hey, just get stuck in, have a bit of a play with identity, and uh, you know, let me know what your experiences are uh, with ASP.NET 5 and identity and everything. Anyway, I've been Ben Cole. Have a great day, and I'll catch you guys later. Cheers. Did you get all that? We'll take the SSW TV quiz and test your knowledge now.